Across three decades of exploration, a French archaeologist named Ludovic Slimak has walked through silent river valleys and climbed into cold, forgotten caves that stretch from the Horn of Africa to the Arctic Circle. He has spent half his life chasing the vanished shadows of another humanity. But among all the places he's searched, none has shaped his mind more than a quiet rock shelter hidden in the Rhone Valley of southeastern France, a place called Grotte Mandrin. Slimak began digging there as a young man. Year after year, he returned to the same patch of earth, brushing away dust and wind-blown sand until the ground itself began to tell a story. Beneath those layers, he uncovered traces of fire rings, flint, points and ash. But one day, among thousands of fragments, he found something that would rewrite the story of our species, a small milk tooth perfectly preserved in the dust. That tiny tooth belonging to a child who lived 56,000 years ago carried a revelation modern humans had set foot in Europe 10,000 years earlier than anyone had believed. To prove it, Slimak and his team used a technique so precise that it reads time like rings inside a tree, foliage or chronology, the dating of soot. They studied thin black films left by ancient campfires on the ceiling of the cave. Layer by layer, they measured how smoke had settled over centuries, building a calendar of human presence. What they discovered was astonishing. The layer containing that human child's tooth lay directly above the ashes of Neanderthals, separated by less than a single year. Two species, two worlds touching for a brief moment in the same shelter before one disappeared and the other began its long ascent. From that point on, Slimak's question changed. He no longer asked when we arrived, but why we survived. What made our ancestors endure while the Neanderthals vanished? What secret trait allowed Homo sapiens to outlast every cousin who once shared this planet? For decades, scientists have answered with one word, creativity. They said we invented art, ritual, and imagination. But Slimak's work at Mandarin tells a colder story. In his words, creativity wasn't what made us human. The Neanderthals had plenty of that, what defined us was efficiency, our obsession with repetition, precision, and standardization. In those windswept layers, Slimak found something deeper than bones or tools. He found a mirror. He realized that the very instinct that allowed sapiens to build, to teach, to expand, that drive to make every tool the same, every gesture repeatable, still shapes us today. It is why we mass produce, why we copy, why we dominate. It was never art that gave us power, but the relentless pursuit of order. And that is what this story is truly about. Not only the meeting between two species, but the meeting between creativity and conformity, freedom and efficiency. It is the tale of how a single human impulse, the desire to make things identical, became the most powerful force on Earth. In the next moments, you'll walk beside Slimak into the depths of Mandarin Cave. You'll see how a handful of soot and a child's tooth reveal the origins of our nature and perhaps the danger within it. Because this isn't just a story of archaeology, it's the story of us how a harmless habit became the reason we ruled the world and the reason we might lose it. When Ludovic Slimak and his team began to dig deeper into Grot Mandarin, they realized they were standing on top of a geological library. Twelve distinct archaeological layers lay stacked one above another, each a page written by wind, fire and human hands. Every centimetre of soil held thousands of flint fragments, burnt bones and traces of hearths left behind by ancient occupants. Over the years, the team collected and catalogued more than a million pieces, mapping the slow rhythm of occupation, people arriving, thriving, vanishing and then being replaced. But one discovery stopped time. Between two unmistakably Neanderthal levels, Slimak's group found a thin horizon of ash and stone unlike anything else in Europe. The tools from that layer were smaller, sharper, and made with an obsessive precision. Slimak called this new culture the Neronian, named after the local valley. What startled him was not only how refined these tools were, but where they appeared right in the middle of Neanderthal territory. To understand when this intrusion had happened, the team turned again to the black smoke stains above them. Using Fuliginer chronology, the reading of soot layers, they could trace every campfire that had burned beneath the cave roof. Each layer of soot represented a separate visit, a separate moment in time. And the soot above the Neronian layer was separated from the one below by almost nothing less than a single season, perhaps only a few months. 
It was as if one group had packed up and left, and almost immediately another had walked in, two humanities sharing the same shelter, breathing the same air, yet never meeting. The dating results overturned decades of textbooks. For generations, archaeologists believed that modern humans didn't reach Europe until around 42,000 years ago. But at Mandarin, the evidence told a different story. The Neronian tools and that tiny child's tooth were dated to between 56 and 51,000 years before the present. That means our species had arrived at least 10,000 years earlier than anyone thought. The timeline of human migration had to be rewritten, and the flints themselves spoke even louder. Under Slimax microscope, the Neronian points revealed a pattern of precision unlike anything in Neanderthal craftsmanship. Each blade followed the same invisible plan. Out of 1,500 measured tools, more than 80% varied by less than a millimeter in width. The makers were not improvising, they were reproducing. Every motion of the hand followed a shared mental template, as if a strict recipe had been memorized and repeated endlessly. By contrast, the layers above and below the work of Neanderthal toolmakers looked like a gallery of individuality. Their Mausterian tools were rougher but alive with personality. No two scrapers were the same. Edges were retouched in unique ways, angles shifted, shapes improvised according to mood or material. What sapiens achieved in uniformity, Neanderthals expressed in diversity. Each Neanderthal toolkit was an act of creative freedom. Each sapiens toolkit was a statement of discipline. Standing amid those layers, Slimak began to sense that he was seeing not just tools but philosophies of being. On one side, a species that celebrated variation. On the other, a species that perfected repetition. That single difference, the ability to follow and preserve a pattern, might have been the quiet revolution that changed everything. From a few centimeters of ash and stone, a question rose that still echoes today. What truly separates us from every other human who ever lived? Perhaps it isn't our creativity at all, but our devotion to a shared design. When Slimak compared the layers of Grotta Mandarin, he realized he wasn't just looking at tools. He was looking at two entirely different ways of seeing the world. On one side stood the Neanderthals' inventive, spontaneous, deeply individual. Their hands shaped each flint point as if it were a signature. Every tool told a personal story, every scraper a small experiment in design. In their camps, no two edges matched, no two shapes repeated. Each one carried the imprint of a maker's momentary decision. To Slimak, this was art raw, instinctive, alive. The Neanderthals didn't simply make tools, they expressed themselves through them. On the other side were the sapiens, the newcomers from the south who approached stone, not as a canvas, but as a system. Their tools were not one-of-a-kind creations, they were reproductions of a shared ideal. Every blade was part of an invisible blueprint, a design that could be repeated, taught, and scaled. This was more than craftsmanship. It was the first production line in human history. Long before factories and assembly lines, Homo sapiens had discovered the power of standardization. This shift in mentality was revolutionary. Standardization changed how people learned and how they lived together. A Neanderthal child had to experiment to find his own way of shaping stone. A sapiens child, by contrast, could be shown a single model and reproduce it perfectly. Knowledge no longer depended on personal discovery. It could be transmitted quickly, reliably across generations. This ability turned scattered families into connected networks. It meant that people separated by mountains or deserts could still make tools that fit together as if crafted by one mind. Slimak described it as a kind of prehistoric internet, a web of shared mental templates linking groups across thousands of miles. The same Neronian points found in the Rhone Valley appeared almost identically at sites in the Levant, more than 2,000 miles away. The shape, the flaking pattern, even the angle of pressure were the same. This was not coincidence. It was communication. The makers were passing along not just tools, but the idea of those tools, a mental code that survived distance and time. And that, Slimak believed, was the real secret behind our success. The sapien's mind is collective. We don't just imitate. We synchronize. We align our thoughts, our actions, and our expectations until entire communities move in rhythm. It's how we cooperate, how we scale, how we dominate but it's also how we conform. When we agree on one perfect way to make something, all other ways begin to vanish. 
In this light, the archaeological record reads like a psychological map. Neanderthal layers pulse with variation, each tool a unique heartbeat. Sapiens layers beat like a drum, steady, uniform, predictable. What once was a sign of efficiency now begins to look like something deeper, almost biological. It suggests that we carry within us an instinct not only to copy but to be the same. We need alignment. We crave consistency. Slimak saw this as both our gift and our curse. Standardization made us powerful. It let us build networks of trust that could stretch across continents. Yet it also demanded the sacrifice of individuality. The Neanderthals, for all their small numbers, were free spirits. We became builders of systems. And from that moment on, the rhythm of humanity changed from the wild music of improvisation to the steady hum of the machine. As Slimak dug deeper into the mystery of Mandarin, he began to realize that the story of replacement was not written only in stone, it was written in our blood. The evidence from ancient DNA revealed a quiet but undeniable truth. The genetic exchange between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens was one-sided. Every modern human alive today carries traces of Neanderthal ancestry, small fragments woven into our genomes like faint echoes of another people. But when scientists sequenced the last known Neanderthal genomes, they found nothing of us inside them. The flow of genes moved in only one direction. We absorbed them, but they never absorbed us. To Slimak, this wasn't just a biological fact, it was a social revelation. It suggested that when the two species met, the encounters were not equal unions, but asymmetrical relationships. In a sense, Homo sapiens didn't just outcompete Neanderthals, we absorbed them without ever truly connecting. We took, but we didn't share. The same pattern that showed up in the soil, the dominance of standardization and system, now appeared in the genetic record. Slimak drew on anthropology to explain what might have happened. In many small-scale human societies, alliances between groups are built through reciprocal exchange, especially through the movement of women between clans. My sister joins your family and yours joins mine. That's how peace is kept and information spreads. But between Neanderthals and Sapiens, this ancient rule seems to have failed. The newcomers may have taken Neanderthal women into their groups, but there's no sign that they gave their own in return. Whether through hostility, social incompatibility, or partial infertility, the relationship was broken from the start. It was not war, it was exclusion. And so the Neanderthals became isolated, not just genetically, but socially. They were cut off from what Slimak called the first global network, a web of connected sapiens communities that stretched from the Levant to Western Europe. While Neanderthal bands remained small, independent and inventive, the sapiens world grew into an expanding lattice of shared behavior and belief. Integration into that network meant survival. Falling outside, it meant extinction. The layers at Mandrin echo this story with eerie precision. One moment a Neanderthal hearth burns quietly in the cave. Then in less than a year it goes cold and a sapiens fire is kindled in the same spot, yet the two never mingle. There are no hybrid tools, no mixed traditions, no signs of collaboration. The replacement happened almost invisibly, like one social system slipping over another and erasing it. It wasn't a conquest of weapons, but of structure, one order absorbing another through sheer efficiency. Slimak often says that Neanderthals did not fail. They simply chose a different way of being human. They lived slower, thought deeper, created individually. They valued expression over expansion. But in a world where survival favored replication, not reflection, their way had no future. The same trait that made us thrive, the need to coordinate, to systematize, to bring everyone into the same rhythm, became the mechanism of their disappearance. And so the story of Neanderthals ends not with violence, but with silence. The fires went out, the songs stopped, and a single pattern spread until nothing else remained. Efficiency won, and with it the age of individuality faded into ash. In the end, the story buried beneath Grotmandrin isn't just a story about two vanished species. It's a mirror held up to us, a reflection of the choices we still make every day. When we look back across those five, six, zero, zero, zero years, what we see is not only how efficiency met individuality, but how efficiency won. And yet, as Slimak reminds us, victory is not the same as wisdom. From the first standardized blades to the tools in our hands today, the same rhythm has echoed through human history. 
The drive to make things faster, cleaner, more uniform, it never stopped. It carried us from flint workshops to assembly lines, from wheels to engines, from computer chips to robotic arms. Every generation improved the design, shortened the process, tightened the pattern. We've perfected the logic of repetition so completely that it has become invisible, the water we swim in the heartbeat of civilization itself. But the price of that perfection is becoming clear. The world we've built is efficient, yes, but it's also fragile. Our cities, our supply chains, our ideas, all look the same, move the same, depend on the same systems. When everything becomes identical, one crack can bring the whole structure down. What began as a survival strategy has turned into a vulnerability. And it's not just our tools that have been standardized. It's our culture, our values, our very imagination. We wear the same brands, stream the same shows, repeat the same opinions. Our efficiency has reached the human spirit itself. Slimax Neanderthals, those patient artisans who shaped each flint like a small act of creation, remind us that diversity once defined what it meant to be human. In our pursuit of progress, we've mistaken uniformity for unity. The echo of Mandrine grows louder today, not quieter. Just as Neanderthals vanished under the weight of a hyper-efficient system, countless species around us are now disappearing under ours. Forests, languages, and even ways of thinking are going extinct, not because of hate, but because of efficiency. We are building what Slimak might call a planet Mandarin, a world ruled by one model of life, one rhythm, one unbreakable pattern. It works flawlessly until it doesn't. Yet Slimak does not end his story in despair. He believes that understanding this instinct, our hunger for standardization, gives us a chance to control it. Awareness, he says, is a form of rebellion, if we can see the mechanism, we can choose when to use it and when to step outside it. The lesson of Mandarin is not to reject efficiency, but to balance it with imagination, with individuality, with the courage to be different. Because if Neanderthals represent the beauty of creative variation and sapiens the power of collective precision, then our future depends on learning to hold both truths at once. Creativity without structure collapses. Structure without creativity destroys. The survival of our species may depend not on what we can make identical, but on what we can still allow to be unique. So, as we leave the cave of Mandarin behind, the question lingers, who are we living as today, the Neanderthal or the Sapiens? And if you want to keep exploring how our ancient past still shapes the world we build, stay with us. Subscribe, listen, and remember the story of humanity isn't finished yet. We are still choosing every day what kind of humans we want to be.